As I preach this message, we find ourselves in a very trying, difficult situation. The worldwide outbreak of the coronavirus has placed this country on lockdown, and it's definitely not business as usual. Sadly, that even includes the church. How great it would be if you could all be out here with me, uh, gathering together for a sunrise service, out in the cool of the morning, smelling the blue bonnets, the birds singing, our voices lifted up to the Lord in praise and worship, celebrating the greatest event the world has ever known, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to be able to do it this year, so um, I'm trying to do something a little bit different, a little bit special for the recording of this message. Uh, here we are out at Peter's Diamond D by God's Grace Ranch, uh, Bubba and Molly's place, and I'm going to preach an Easter message with what most of you will recognize if you are a member of Bethel Baptist Church as our sunrise service backdrop the old rugged cross on the uh, tank dam at, at Bubba's. I want to begin by reading the passage I'm going to be using as my text today, 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. <clears throat> now let me ask you a question. What does it mean when you say you're a Christian? Many would respond by saying, it means I conduct my life in a certain way. I behave a certain way. If I ask for examples, you might say, well, I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I obey the Golden Rule. I love my neighbor as myself. I read my Bible. I go to church. I try to live a moral life. I do good things for those who are less fortunate. Uh, that's what it means to be a Christian. But is that what it really means to be a Christian? Or is being a Christian more about what you believe? Actually, a genuine, authentic Christian believes certain things. When you say you're a Christian, your beliefs are what you should have in mind. If you truly believe and place your faith in the things the Bible teaches about Jesus, this is going to lead you to behave in a certain manner worthy to be called a believer in Jesus Christ, or as we say, a Christian. When it comes to Easter, we always zero in on one element of our Christian belief that is key foundational and absolutely essential and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that's what Easter is all about the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus in the passage we read earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Paul stresses Jesus resurrection as that one most critical element in our Christian faith and I believe he presents the reasons for our, our belief in the resurrection of Jesus very well so I want to use this as the focus of my message today. Later in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul also goes on to present the basis for our Christian belief that we will be resurrected uh, from the dead and achieve victory over sin and death. Uh, because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead and lives, we as believers can also expect to be raised from the dead and live. Many feel that Paul wrote this letter very early in the history of the church. So this was some very foundational teaching that Paul wanted to emphasize to these uh, Corinthian believers who were being pummeled with all kinds of false teachings. Paul wrote in Romans 10 verse 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. To be saved from your sins and know eternal life with God, you must believe two things. Jesus is who he said he was the Son of God and Savior of the world, Lord, as we call it, and that God raised him from the dead. 
You've got to believe both parts in order to be saved. If you say, well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and died for my sins, but I don't really believe he rose bodily from the grave, you fail the test of Christian belief at that point. If you don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, it would be hard to call yourself a true Christian. You really shouldn't be calling yourself a Christian. Your beliefs don't match up with a genuine, fundamental Christian faith. Now, I'm not pulling that out of thin air. It's not just uh, Clyde saying that. Uh, the Bible says that. God says that. Uh, the quote from Romans 10 verse 9 is uh, God's word, and uh, that pretty much says it all. The problem Paul was addressing with the believers at Corinth was not actually belief in the resurrection of Jesus. They were believers in Jesus' resurrection. What they were questioning was whether they would be resurrected the way Jesus was, in bodily form. But in trying to reaffirm this truth to the Corinthians, Paul felt he needed to review the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, which is uh, a good teaching for us all. The predominant teaching of Greek philosophy at that time was something called dualism. Plato's philosophical teachings were having a big influence on the Greek culture of that day, and Plato taught that humans consisted of two parts, the body and the spirit. He said the body was evil and the spirit was good. So when you died, according to Plato, the body being evil would just cease to exist, and the spirit being good was then released to go back to God or some, some version of, of God. Uh, now, this, is, as you can see, is very different from the Christian belief of a bodily resurrection like that of Jesus. As he began to counter this teaching of dualism, Paul led off with the evidences for believing in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He began this way. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Now, gospel means good news. I make known to you, I remind you of the good news. He wanted to uh, have the Corinthians believers remember and think back on the good news that he had preached to them and which they had received, meaning taken to heart or believed. He was saying, remember what brought you to faith and belief in the first place. It was the good news of a resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what you now stand on as Christians. He's reminding them of the testimony of the apostles who first proclaimed this good news. Immediately after Jesus' death, his apostles hid out, fearing for their lives. They began to go their separate ways. They lost all hope. And then just a few days later, what were they doing? They were boldly proclaiming a risen Jesus to anyone and everyone. They were risking their lives to deliver the message of hope. Jesus had risen from the dead. Now that kind of change in behavior is hard to imagine for something contrived or made up. The testimony of the apostles and the church is clear. Jesus is alive from the dead. He is risen, just as he said. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Now, news is supposed to be factual, not made up, not manufactured, not slanted to support some point of view or a certain agenda. Just the facts, ma'am, as they used to say on that old cop show, Dragnet. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Just the facts presented the way it actually happened. Now, unfortunately, that is often not the case today. There is a lot of fake news going around and fact checking is necessary much of the time. But if you do some fact checking on the gospel, the good news of a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, you will find that it is really, really good news because very good evidence supports the claim. Now that's what the believers at Corinth had done. They heard the reports, they listened to the teaching, they checked out the facts, and they believed Jesus rose from the grave. That sort of defines what it means to be an authentic Christian. As I said earlier, Christianity is not really about what you do, it's about what you believe. But what you believe without question is a big determining factor in what you do and how you behave. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Basically what this verse is telling us is if you have confidence, if you have assurance, if you have belief in the promises of God, the things we're hoping for, then you will live out your life based on those convictions. You'll live your life based on your confident belief in the promises of God. 
Your belief will dictate the way you conduct your life. Christianity is called a religion, but authentic Christianity is really not a religion. It's not about do these things and earn favor with God and get to heaven. Don't do these things or you'll lose favor with God and not get to heaven. If you had to accomplish a bunch of do's and don'ts to please God and get to heaven, that would not constitute good news for most people. I know it certainly wouldn't for me. I mean, the stress and the tension and the worry, or did I do enough good things today to be in line for heaven? Uh, did I avoid enough bad things so that I didn't lose my status today? I mean, you know, that's just not a way to, to live your life. Christianity is not about what anyone has to do. It's just belief in the good news. And the good news is this. God has provided a way through Jesus to have a resurrected eternal life with him. That's the witness of the apostles and the church as confirmed by the Bible. The end of verse 2 in 1 Corinthians 10 is, is important. Uh, speaking of authentic Christian faith, Paul says you have it if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Now this is a warning against a non-saving faith. Holding fast to the teaching concerning Christ's resurrection and the resurrection of true believers is evidence of genuine salvation. However, by what Paul says, it's also evident that there can be some in the church who lack true saving faith. Their belief is in vain, as he calls it. Now, Paul was firm in his teaching about the security of the believer. Uh, let me read to you from Romans 8, beginning in, in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now this uh, makes it clear that uh, once you're saved, you're always saved. But it also makes it clear that God is the one who does the saving. God is the one who does the securing. God does the holding fast when it comes to true salvation. It's not something you or I can do successfully on our own. Someone who professes to be a Christian but then fully rejects his or her faith and, and uh, walks away uh, proves that they never really had a true saving faith in the first place. Their belief was not a true belief. That person is able to let go of the good news because he or she was always the one doing the holding on rather than God. To better describe this, let me, let me use an illustration from the animal world. Uh, those who believe in vain have what I would describe as a possum faith. You ever see a mama possum with her babies? Those little possums are holding on to their mama for all they're worth as she climbs through the tree limbs. They know if they get shaken loose or they let go, their life is over. It's all dependent on their ability to hang on. Their security is all dependent upon them. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. Some people believe that when you become a Christian, you grab hold of Jesus and you try to hang on for dear life. If you ever let go, that's it. The devil's got you. But it is your choice, and if you choose to let go, then that's certainly your business. That's a possum faith. That's a faith that is in vain. True faith is what you could call a cat faith. You ever see a mama cat with her babies moving them from one place to another? She grabs that kitten by the scruff of the neck and it doesn't matter what that kitten does or doesn't do, mama cat will not let go until they get where they're going. Uh, the well-being and the security of the kitten is totally dependent upon the mama cat and she never fails to hang on to those kittens. I believe the Bible teaches cat faith. When there is a true profession of faith, God grabs hold of your soul and he never lets go until you're safe in heaven. Once you're saved, you're always saved because God does the holding on. Uh, that kind of faith comes through belief in the resurrection, belief in the good news presented by the apostles and the church. Paul offers a second proof of, of, of the resurrection of Jesus and that is the witness of the scriptures. The Old Testament is just chock full of prophecies that clearly speak of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. When Paul says, I delivered to you, 
He means he brought authoritative proof. He brought God's word. He brought the scriptures. He didn't come up with this teaching on his own. What he presented to them came from the word of God. After his resurrection, Jesus, speaking to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, said, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. That's Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. The whole Bible, beginning to end, is about Jesus, and it speaks of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that's what Jesus was pointing out. When Jesus' Messiahship was questioned, he responded with these words. An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's Matthew 12, 39 through 40. Jesus was speaking there about his resurrection. Jonah's encounter, his, his spending three days in the belly of that great fish, was a picture of Jesus' resurrection to new life. Uh, Jonah's uh, time there, three, his three days in the belly of the fish, was a resurrection sign for what was going to take place in the life of Jesus. In Acts 2, verses 25 through 31, Peter quoted from Psalm 16. And then he stated that David, the author of that psalm, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. In other words, David looked ahead and saw the resurrection of Jesus, and he wrote about it in that psalm. As he testified before King Agrippa, Paul stated, And so, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Moses and the prophets spoke of the Messiah's death and resurrection, and Paul was called by God to point that out as proof of who Jesus was. Jesus was resurrected, therefore he was the Messiah, he was the Savior of the world. Specific Old Testament passages such as Genesis 22, verse 8, Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Hosea 6, verse 2. Uh, you'll find those Old Testament uh, passages quoted by Jesus or Peter or Paul and, uh, just, and a bunch more that I, I, I'm not listing here. But uh, you can check these out and you will see that directly, indirectly, figuratively and literally the Old Testament clearly speaks of Jesus death burial and resurrection and this is hundreds of years before these events actually took place Paul reminds the Corinthians of what the scriptures testified to concerning Jesus with particular emphasis on his resurrection they didn't have to believe him but to not believe the resurrection of Jesus was not to believe the Bible it was it meant you did not believe the clear word of God Paul points out one more proof in these verses for the resurrection of Jesus. There were eyewitnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5-8, you find a list of first-hand eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. These were people who actually saw Jesus alive after his death and burial. Now, what's considered to be one of the most reliable forms of evidence in a court of law? Responsible, honest eyewitnesses, right? And Paul has a considerable list of these people. He begins by mentioning Jesus' appearance to Peter, or Cephas, as Paul calls him, and the apostles. And then he mentions Jesus appearing to over 500 people at one time. Paul mentions Jesus' resurrection appearance to his half-brother, James. And then he speaks of Jesus' resurrection appearances to his apostles, which occurred over a period of 40 days before Jesus ascended back to heaven. And lastly, Paul mentions Jesus' resurrection appearance to him. Now, something very important to keep in mind here is the fact that most of these eyewitnesses Paul mentions were still alive at the time he wrote this. You could go and ask these people about what they saw. You could question them. You could uh, debate them if you really wanted to get down to that. But uh, what these people saw was Jesus alive from the dead, resurrected. Now, it's hard to believe that over 500 people would have the same dream or hallucination at different times. Paul 
Paul goes on and tells us Jesus appeared to James. Most likely, this is Jesus' half-brother. And that would be significant because, you see, Jesus' half-brother James was not a believer before Jesus' death and resurrection. He thought Jesus was out of his mind. After he saw Jesus resurrected, James became a believer. He became a, a key leader in the church in Jerusalem. He wrote the book of James, we find in our New Testament. Seeing someone you know well, risen from the dead, will do that to you. It's going to cause a radical change in the way you conduct your life. It's very hard to fool your brother. Over the years, judges, lawyers, and scholars have poured over the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. And the conclusion has invariably been this. If you accept the normal ways of verifying the witness to an event, the proof for Jesus' resurrection is overwhelming. We have evidence before the fact, the Old Testament prophecies. We have words from the prophets of God written a thousand years before it happened that the resurrection was going to take place. We have evidence after the fact in all of these eyewitnesses and changed lives that the resurrection actually did take place. Paul, or Saul as he was called then, was a violent persecutor of the church until Jesus appeared to him and asked him this, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When Saul asked who it was who was speaking, Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul was never the same after that. And at first it was very hard for people to accept the change. He was so radically different. He began to preach the good news of a risen Jesus in all the synagogues. He wrote a big part of our New Testament and he died a martyr for his belief. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul describes the lives of those in the Corinthian church, uh, the lives they had previously lived. Uh, but then what happened? Well, they came to know their risen Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord, and that made a huge difference in who they were. And the risen Jesus can make all the difference in your life today. He can come into your life and change your heart, make you a totally different person. And the great thing is, he wants to do that. It is his greatest desire to be able to do that. Your past doesn't matter. Uh, Peter, a very close associate and apostle of Jesus, uh, denied him three times at the most, most critical moments. Uh, Paul was a murderer and a persecutor of the church and those who followed Jesus. These Corinthian believers had been extremely immoral. They were idolaters. They didn't even believe in the God of the Bible before they came to know the risen Jesus. The past does not matter. Confession of your sin and acceptance of the risen Lord Jesus as your Savior can change your past. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we know there is life after life in this life. And because of his promises, we know Jesus has made a way for us to be there with him. That's the good news I want to make known to you today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you take these words and you use them uh, in the most effective way to, to reach those who maybe have some questions, uh, those who have some concerns, those who really don't have that true saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I pray that your spirit would find an, an opening and uh, a way into the hearts of all of those who hear this message and need to believe. It's in Jesus' name I pray.